The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Open your Bibles to Hebrews, ninth chapter. <clears throat> Looking at verses 14 and 15 again. I want to do a couple other studies, or at least another one from it. Hebrews 9.14, how much more, that's a special phrase that's of importance to us, how much more with the blood of Christ, how much more than verse 13, the blood of calves and goats and under the law, how much more with the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, another special phrase, he is the mediator because of verse 14. He is the mediator of a new covenant in order that since that's another special phrase in order that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions, plural, that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. And my subject is going to come from that last part of that. The, the, the redemption of the transgressions, which earlier was called eternal redemption, <clears throat> committed under the first, will cover, cover those who have been called so that they can receive the promise of eternal inheritance. I'm going to show you something about that tonight, <clears throat> about how all-inclusive that idea is, how all-inclusive that idea is uh, in the plan of redemption. Well, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our study uh, this evening. I gave you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, the privilege to confess sin. Why would that be important? Can't study the Bible in the carnality. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Carnality is a flesh issue. The Bible is to be studied under the spirit of truth ministry. So if you're carnal, how would I know it? Well, evidence would be mental attitude sins or sins of the tongue or vert sins that have been unconfessed. First John 1 John 1.9 says, confess your sins. You do that through your own priesthood. You confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. You take care of your own business. And that's how you're spiritual. Then that, re that allows you to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit who indwells you. And the word of God should be learned under the ministry of the Holy Spirit and applied to your life. And we call that classroom etiquette here. And for those who are visiting us with on the Internet, we expect the same courtesy that the people show us in the assembly. So I give everybody a moment of time. Confess sin, examine that, and then push into your prayer life and ask God to teach you something relevant to your life and your spiritual growth and something that would be helpful for other people to know. That's called ministry. Well, Father, we're thankful tonight for these who are with us tonight, both by automobile and by internet. It's good to have Glenda back with us tonight, and I thank you, Father, for bringing her back with us and uh, pray for her continued health. It's just good to see her smiling face back in class, and we thank you for that. Pray for so many others that are not here tonight because of their absence. They're probably, they're probably not doing well, and so we lift them before you. I pray tonight, Father, for those who are attending with us on the Internet, that they will uh, stay with us for the hour of study. Um, if you study with us, you're going to have to read 2 Peter 3.16 that tells you to put on your thinking cap because sometimes uh, you're going to have to really stop and think, not just sit and, and emote but you're going to actually have to use your brain and think and let the Holy Spirit teach you some things. So I pray for that tonight. 
I pray as we look at the redemption of the transgressions committed under this first covenant, how it affects those as well as those of us under the new covenant or the second covenant. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things we're going to see tonight in this passage is that the transgressions committed under the first covenant, which would be from Adam to Christ, are covered on the work of Christ on the cross in eternal redemption. I'm going to show you some unique things about that in theology tonight. When we study verses 14, 15, and uh, well, verses 14 and 15, there are three phases, phrases that are really important uh, to theology. Now, they don't seem like that, maybe. But once you understand what the theme of the book is, until we get to chapter 11, it's the superiority of the new covenant over the old covenant. And everything about the new covenant began with Christ. So, like, in verse 14, there's a phrase, how much more? And I wrote it out in the Greek for those who are interested in, in the Greek language of how that is structured. But the English is pretty well. How much more? I think we would all understand that. And what this means in the passage of understanding of Scripture is the superiority of the new covenant blood of Christ over the blood of the old covenant, which was called the old covenant or the first covenant uh, of animals, which were shadow Christology. In other words, they, they pointed to Christ too, but prophetically, where when we talk about Christ after he has come and died on a cross, we're talking, we point to him historically. He came, he died, he was buried, he was raised and documented historically. Now, in the ninth chapter, verse 26, there's a phrase that, that fits the story of Luke with the, the birth of the incarnation is called the consummation. Uh, in Galatians 4.4, 4, uh, it would be described in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son born of a woman born under the law. The same thing would be recorded in Romans 5, 6. Uh, all of the pivot that, all of the spiritual pivot that was looking for the coming of the Messiah and thought it was, it would be um, immediate because of the preaching of John the Baptist and all of that. Um and those um, that were really on top of what's going on, kind of like we are with the second coming of Christ, those who were on top of the first coming of Christ, like in Luke 1 and 2, were looking for that. They were looking for the, cons- the consolation. Um, and, but, but in Hebrews, so that idea is picked up, and it, it st- it's stated this way. But now at the consummation of the ages, we call that the incarnation of Christ. Uh, He has been manifest to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. I can't begin to tell you how big a deal the incarnation is of Jesus Christ. Now, we in the church really understand that the birth of Christ uh, and all that's connected, that's, that's always been a big deal. The birth of Christ, not Christmas, but the birth of Christ has always been a big issue like Easter is. The problem is... um, I'm afraid that Christmas has lost its impact, that Easter hasn't. I mean, everybody understands Easter is about the resurrection. But there's, such, there's so, so much confusion about Christmas because Santa Claus and everything. Okay. So the, it's, there's not, I mean, but Christmas is about the birth of Christ. But it gets kind of confused historically in a, in a nation where it shouldn't be confused. Now, we as Christians, we, we try to hold the line on that and, and try to make sure that everybody within our periphery understands the importance of Christ. But I'm just saying that what happened to the birth of Christ got clouded where the resurrection didn't. I mean, I mean, they, they tried to sell us bunnies and eggs, but nobody's buying it. I mean, we, we, we believe he was a lamb of God. But anyhow, it's just kind of interesting historically how some things catch and some things don't. But, but, but when he says at the, at the consummation of the ages, he's talking about the importance of the incarnation of Christ. And theologically, it's, it's not taught as much as it should be. In fact, I'm thinking about adding um, a class to our theology school on just the incarnation of Christ because it's not being taught like it used to be. When, when I first came into Christianity, it was as big as, I mean, it, everybody understood it. 
I'm not sure. I'm not sure people understand the the enormous passage like this. But now at the consummation of ages, if it wasn't the fact that it says he has been manifest to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, Christian wouldn't even know what he was talking about. But that's a clue to them when they hear, oh, that he's talking about the guy who died for the sin. Well, that's Jesus, and that. You know, but the consummation covers that whole period from the incarnation. Um, but anyhow, it, but the, see what I'm really saying is there are little phrase in there <laughs> that's missed. The little phrase that's in is how much more. And so I wanted to emphasize that. The second phrase is in verse 15. The little phrase in there says, and for this reason. And, and that's kind of a, this is, where the other one is kind of unusual phrase. This is kind of a common phrase in the Greek language. You will see this a lot. Diatoto. You'll see that a lot. And um, this, and when you have a preposition, it's attached to different things. This is this is attached to the eye. This is causative. This is the causative, and it means because. And for this reason, pressing the idea on account of this or because of this, but it's it's bigger than just adding a little idea in there. It, it's it's kind of like highlighting something. Um, and for this reason, which was verse fourteen, the consummation business uh of the blood of christ and for this reason the superiority of the new covenant membership uh mediatorship of jesus christ becomes this is what that's highlighting it's kind of like a spotlight spotting certain things this little phrase and for this reason it's like a spotlight hitting and saying like look what i got to say to you is based all based on the fact that christ comes sacrificed himself it was it everything is about the blood of coming it's not his virgin birth i mean he had to have it but listen, if he doesn't, he who knew no sin became sin for us. If that's not important, that's the impeccability. That's him being faithful to carry the mission out. And we know his own struggles that were uh, disclosed to us. It, I mean, it, was a tough, it was tough to get there, right? I mean, the Garden of Gethsemane, for example. And so um, what is the mediator of? He's between a holy God and a sinful man. And he is the only way. He tried to tell his disciples, I am the only way to God. There is no other way. I bet your religion won't get you there. If, if there's a religion without Christ dying on a cross, being buried and raised from the dead, that religion is vain to worship. It's empty worship. So, and so one of the interesting little words that uh, the writer of Hebrews puts in about better, trying to show superiority, there's a little word called better. And when, he's use it, when he uses it, He's talking about comparing the old covenant to the new covenant and how much better we are for having the new covenant. You understand that? Because the old covenant just pointed you to Christ, kept pointing you historically to when he would come. That's called the consummation of the ages. And so in the seventh chapter, verse 22, the word better. You, and, and listen, what you ought to do is I'm putting you onto something. When you read through the book of Hebrews sometime, just pay attention to how many times he uses the word better and how he uses it. And so I just pulled out three for you. A 7.22 of Hebrews 8.6 and 12.24 where he uses the word better. The next time you do a little Bible study, look for that word. Pay attention to that in the book of Hebrews. The third phrase that's important to our study tonight is in verse 15, the last half of it. Another phrase that says, in order that. This is one little word, uh, hopas. All of that is comes out of one little word in the Greek language in order that sense. And, and it's, it's not used a lot. It's rare. It's in fact, it's a rare, rarely used word. And so when we spot a word like this, and it takes so many words to, to explain that one word, look at all the words, look at all the words in English. It took to explain that one Greek word, hopos in order that sense. And, and, and so you, when you see a word like that, or you see a phrase like that, you start looking in there to see what this, it's a spotlight on something. And so what you see is the superiority, because that's, that's the theme, the superiority, listen to me now, of new covenant redemption. And I'm going to tell you some things about it tonight that will open your eyes on it. The superiority of the new covenant redemption, so that the called, now listen to me, so that the called from Adam through Christ may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. That's the whole kit and caboodle. It's not just you. 
It's everybody. Everybody from Adam, every believer from Adam through Christ. Now we know we're in. We, we're into that deal because we're into Christ. But everybody from Adam through Christ was brought in to receive. Now, just think about that. They, they have received the eternal inheritance. And that was one of the things they were always longing to have. And uh, so there are three little phrases there just trying to show you. Maybe, hopefully, that when you read the Bible, you wouldn't speed read it. <laughs> because there's stuff in here like this that's worth taking your time and let the Holy Spirit point some things out to you. Because he'll sure do it. I'm not the only guy that he points this stuff out to. But you have to go slower to get it. Right? I mean, you can't speed through it. To, you're on some kind of diet to go through the Bible in 12 days or something. Um, and then I'll lose 50 pounds. Uh, don't, you know... Take your time and let the Holy Spirit talk to you going through that because the journey is pretty good. Uh, he's a guide. The Bible says he's a guide. If you're going through a forest or going through someplace you've never been, you want to get out to the other end or get back safe, it, it's helpful to have a guide. <clears throat> uh, th this lesson is going to study three aspects of how the redemption of the transgressions committed under the first covenant, committed under the first covenant, made an important impact on both human history and biblical history on both human and biblical history. Now, I want to start with the word transgression. There are different words in the Greek language for transgression. So when you find a word like this and you look it up and you see that, well, gosh, there could be, there could be three or four different words. Now you pay attention to why you picked that word to use. Now, who picked it? Not the writer, the Holy Spirit. All scriptures inspired by God or God breathed. So for a guy like me, I pay attention to stuff. So barabasis is a very important word. It's made up of two. You can see the word bower. That's a preposition. And then on the word bino, the word B-A-S-I-S, -S, the, the verbal form of that is bino. I think somewhere I've said that. But in point number one, the Greek word for transgression is important for the spiritual meaning of why mankind needs grace redemption and why the only begotten son was the only, only person that could meet that need, okay? Just think about that. It, the only person that can meet the need of grace salvation is the only begotten son of God. The only begotten son of God. Now, he's had the son of God for a long time. It's not that the son of God isn't, I mean, the, the, the Godhead, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They were involved in the creation. They were involved in the eternal life conference. I mean, it's not like these aren't, I mean, they're all God. Where Whenever God was in existence, everybody else is. You understand that? And, and, but when you've got the only begotten son, you've got God the son who has taken on human flesh like John talks about in his, as he opens his book up in John 1 and has dwelt among mankind for a reason. Now we know the reason is because he is the source of grace, salvation, of redemption. There's none without it. And so his entrance into human history is a big deal. And almost all the parables, like if you study the parables of Matthew 13, I mean, one right after another, boom, 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 boom. That's the subject. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, what can we care, compare the kingdom of God to? Boom, there's the sun. <laughs> And, w w and what he brings. I mean, Matthew 13, all those parables. I mean, if you look for the theme, it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, uh, Paro Basis was you. Listen to me. Here's what's important. It's a legal term. It's used as a legal term here. It could be used in different ways, but it's used as a legal term. It's used as a legal term because we have the word redemption. We have the word transgression, redemption, transgression. That's a legal word. You go to jail for that. Unless you're a politician. <laughs> right? Most people go to jail for that. Transgression. It's a very strong word. The word transgression and redemption are very important because this word is a legal term. It's used as a legal term referring to the violation of a legal stature. 
it was used spiritually to explain how Adam's original sin, Genesis 2.17, done in the third chapter, warned in the second, how a Adam's original sin was a violation of a legal stature. Genesis 2.17. Now, in Genesis 3.17, after the fact, and we have a court case, you with me? After it's violated, we got a court case in the third chapter. Then Adam, he, then to Adam, God said, he said, God, then to Adam, God said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you saying, and there's, there's the violation. You shall not eat from the tree. It was the one and only commandment he had to follow. Right. I mean, do not, in the do not category, right? I mean, he had positive commands, eat of anything you want to eat, you have a good life, and yeah, yeah, yeah. But he, he gives them one. And you think you could cover one, right? It wasn't like I had to learn a whole book of them. I didn't have to learn 365 or something, you know. But just one, don't eat of that tree, and it, there you go. That, so, but listen, here, here is, here's the court case. Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten. It's not because he listened to the voice of wife. It's because he listened to the voice that said, Do, go against God. Right? So I make that clear. Right? In case Jane's listening. <laughs> and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you. See, that's why it's called a transgression. Because there was a law established. The law of the garden. There was just one. You shall not eat from it. There it was. And so, I mean, I get pushbacks from uh, even professors of theology when I refer to Adam's sin as judicial. They, I don't see where you get this idea of judicial. Well, I get there are so many words I don't even know where to begin. They're legal terms like transgression, words like that. They're, I mean, where, where, why are you going to have justification and all the things that come on the backside of it? I mean, of course it is. And it's, but here's the, the bottom line is because God commands you that he established the law. If you violate it, unless it carried the death penalty, that's a strong law. You know? It's not swatting a fly. That's a strong, that's a strong deal. I command you, you shall not eat of it. And then he says, if you eat, you know, you will die, right? Die and you will die. Well, <clears throat> for me, I mean, my, I'm not here to convince anybody. I'm just here to teach you. I mean, that's the good part of mine. I don't have to convince you. you God grades you. I don't. <laughs> I wouldn't know how to grade you. This, this is why Adam's original sin, AOS, this is why Adam's original sin was a judicial violation because it was a violation of a law established by God with consequences. He says, if you do this, then this is what's going to happen to you. I'm going to have to pound you on it. I'm going to get you. I don't know how that went. But I'm just talking like a parent, I guess. Um, it, it was a judicial violation with judgment, with judgment, judgment. Passed to every member of the human race. Listen, when he violated that, as the federal head of the human race, it got passed on to all of us. That's Hebrew, you know, that's that's Romans five twelve in it. Wherefore is by one man Adam sent into the world, and uh, death by sin. And so death was passed on. I think I wrote it down there. Okay, I say it so much, I actually memorize that. It probably a gate question for me. And then I'll, I'll get all nervous and forget it. And I'll be sent back to teach you some more. Um, we call it, what that, we call that is imputed sin. We call that imputed sin. If you, if, you, if you hear that phrase, this is what we're talking about. In theology, imputed sin. And, and it's described, therefore, just as. Watch the word just as and so. And see the word just and? I put it in bold. Now look down a little bit lower. And so. See, it's in, it's in bold print, right? Now, see, it separates those two, two things. One's important to the other. Just as through one man, Adam, 
sin entered to the world and death, one of 13 judicial charges, through sin and so talking about death, spiritual death. And so spiritual death spread to all men. Why? Because all have sinned. Uh, right? Sinned in that, ca- in that way. Because they have sinned in that way. And it's judicial. Um, and you can go on and read all of the rest of that passage, 12 to 21. It'd be well worth your read. All members of the human race are born spiritually dead in Adam. First Corinthians 15, 22 in Adam, all die in Christ. All are made alive. That that's the most powerful passage you could ever find. It's just a simple passage to first Corinthians 15, 22. It says in Adam, all die in Christ. All are made alive. You know why? Because he goes to the cross. He dies. He's buried. He's raised from the dead. Colossians 1, 13, 14 says, when you believe the gospel, you are rescued from Adam and transferred to Christ. Hoo-ah. That's what I say. Uh, so anyway, and another great passage that we, at least I like, and most people talk about, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new crea- crea- creature or creation, a new creation. Everything about the new, new covenant, you know what the key word in the new covenant is? Is new. You follow that thing. Everything Everything once he introduces that, everything about it, you get a new name, you get a new body, you get a new everything. Everything's new. Everything's new. All by grace, too. Everything's new by grace. That's a wonderful study in itself, just the word new under the new covenant. Uh, here's Romans 5, 1 through 3. And again, I'm talking about judicial the judicial, judicial, the violation of that law brought in judicial charges and judgment. Listen, it says, therefore, there is no condemnation. See the word condemnation? I wrote it in the Greek language. Listen, that's a legal term. It's judicial. He's talking judicial. Therefore, no judgment for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. Listen. When you're transferred from Adam where there's all judgment into Christ where there is none, right there? No, if you're in Christ, there's no judgment. There's no condemnation. Why? Because Christ has taken care of all of it. Took care of all of it. Jeez, boy. The, and and Paul, Paul calls, uh, for those who are in Christ Jesus, the law of, of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. You look at that word set free. I mean, you were condemned. You were under judgment. You didn't have no hope out of that situation. And because of the work of Christ on the cross, you're set free. Set free. Not because you earned it, not because you deserved it, because Christ earned, deserved it for you so that you could have it by grace. So to be inclusive, not exclusive to some who couldn't, couldn't afford it. If you live under law, there's always somebody who can't afford it. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Isn't that wonderful? For by grace you're saved through faith and not of yourself as a gift of God, not of works, least any man should boast. God did it. God did it, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. That's a powerful boy. I mean, I mean, why don't you, listen, why don't you just live in the acceptance of that? It would take so much pressure off from your life. Oh, I, I, I just, I, oh, I just did. I know uh, nobody, uh, oh, I can't forgive myself. Uh, why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? You're in a works program. Why are you doing that? You've already been forgiven. Why are you doing that? Self-pity. Why are you doing that? Moaning and groaning. You ought to be thankful. You ought to have a, a happy heart. You know, you're not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you're a sinner as an unbeliever. You're not going to go to hell because you sin. You do know that. 
And if, if Christ died for your, your sins and you believe that, then your sins are not an issue in your life. Walking with God is, a, is an issue in your life. Walking in the power of the Spirit, walking by, why? Because God wants to accomplish what he's, he's given you new birth for. There, there's a whole life for you to live in Christ on earth. Point number two. The death of Jesus Christ was for the sins of the world. He was buried and he was raised. He was uh, raised from the dead on the third day to give eternal life to everyone who believes. He is the Lamb of God that came to take away the sin of the world. The sin of the world. Why does the world accept that? That's crazy not to. First John 2, 2 is the propitiation for the... For the sin of the world. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 tells us the scripture declares that Christ dies for your sins, is buried and raised from the dead the third day. And when you believe it, you get saved. Romans 1, 16. The power to save you is in the gospel and not yourself. John three sixteen. When you believe, you get what? He removes. Listen. When you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, he removes perishing from your life, one of the 13. He removes perishing from you, and what's he put in his place? He always puts something good in the place of what he takes. He takes something bad and puts something good. What did he put? John 3, 16, what did he put? Eternal life. I mean, I know people read it and don't, don't read the best part of it. I like Jim and Nick's barbecue. I'm not priming the pump here. I'm just telling you something. I like Jim and Nick's barbecue. Now, when I came to South, I became a, we didn't do barbecue in the North. I don't know if they still do, but we didn't do it. Barbecue wasn't something I ate, right? I came South. That's what everybody ate. Let's go get barbecue. Let's go get barbecue. And so, and so some barbecue I like, some barbecue I don't. That's kind of interesting. Never ate it before, but, you know, there are a lot of things I never ate before. I don't want to eat again. Once I ate it, I'm going, I ain't eating that again. <clears throat> I liked it so well that when I buy even a sandwich, I, hold, I tell them, hold the bread. They go like, what? I said, well, I want the portion, but I don't want the bread. Because and, and, uh, sweet little lady at the, at the gate where you pay up, she said, are you the man that ordered that with a sandwich without the bread? I said, yes, ma'am, that's me. And she said, could I ask you why you do that? You want a sandwich. You order the sandwich without the bread. Could I just ask you, you know, we have a plate. I said, well, listen, I'll get the plate next time if you sell it to me for the same price. <laughs> She said, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> that's why I don't get, the, I want the meat. I come here for the meat. Show me the meat. So, so skip the bread. I learned that from my wife. I said, why do you do that? And she said, I just like the meat. I don't want the bread. I want the bread takes away from the food. And I, I, I thought, well, one day I'm going to try that. And I went, you know, she's right. So I, but it kind of throws them for a loop in there. Uh, that, you know, we have, and I went, yeah, I know everything you got. I, I'm a regular around here. Chick-fil-A, they get mad at me because sometimes I actually go down to, I spread my love between those two places. The transgression of Adam's original sin involves three categories of sin. Always remember this. Three categories of sin. Where did it come from? Transgression of Adam's original sin. There's imputed sin. That's what's tra That's the 13 judicial charges transferred to every person. That's, that's at Romans 5.12. One of that is, talks about death, spiritual death. There is inherent sin. I put them in eyes so you could remember them. You know, you got three eyes rather than two. Makes you a little odd, but then again, you come here, right? So uh, inherent, inherent sin is the sin nature that we have, the sin nature. Romans, the book of Romans uh, 6, 7, and 8 talk about that a great deal. Uh, the sin nature, and then individual sin or what we call personal sin, okay? 
the, uh, the transgression of Adam's original sin under the first covenant required a historical gospel of Jesus Christ. We call it the incarnation to the death of Christ on the cross, burial and resurrection. Now, listen to me. Here's what Romans is. Here, here's what the he, writer of Hebrews is really pushing. He's saying that the historical gospel of Christ, that he comes historically, he dies, he's buried, he's raised from the dead, etc., completes. Listen to me. This is important. You watch the word complete, the word perfect or complete in the book of Hebrews, about chapters, about from seven to ten. That's a key word, the word complete or perfect in the English. Because what it's referring to as completing, Christ has to complete. See, we have shadow Christology redemption. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. We, we, do, the, we do the blood uh, because it's coming. It's going to require the blood of the son, yada, yada. And when he comes and dies on the cross, it completes all that back. Listen to me. When Jesus, listen to me. I'm going to give you a new insight into uh, uh, what Jesus said on the cross. I'm going to give you a new insight. When he said it is finished and he spoke to the father, it has completed redemption all the way back through Adam. I want you to think about that. Uh, that's the idea. Also in uh, uh, Ephesians 1, 7. Uh, let me grab that for you right here. Ephesians 1, 7 says, he's talking about redempt, this blood redemption deal. 1, 7. It says, in him, in him, that's positional truth. In him, we have redemption through his blood. In other words, that's us looking back. We're on this side. We've been, we have been rescued and transferred. We're looking over here and we're looking back to what, we, what he has given us. From in Christ, this is what we have. That's kind of an era. Paul writes a lot that way because he's writing to believers and said, look, at, listen, you need to look back sometime and see where, 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 what God saved you from too. And, and so he says, in him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. That's the same concept of trans, transgressions according to the riches of his grace. Didn't you love that? Boy, Paul, every time he had a chance, he talked about the riches of God's grace. What a wonderful idea. But that's what he's talking about in the bigger picture. This gospel, the historical gospel, the historical gospel is that Christ came, he died on the cross, buried, and raised, that idea was the one single event in human history. Now, listen to me. Watch this right, right here. Boom. All right, there's the gospel. He dies for our sins, buried and raised from the dead. This event right here is what divides the old covenant from the new covenant. This is what fulfills that and brings that into the prime, prime light of operations. Yeah. That's a huge event. And this whole historical event, this great one big single event is what we call the incarnation. In the big picture, now incarnation can look at a snapshot, which is the birth of Christ, the whole story of the birth of Christ, like Luke 1 and 2 or can look in the bigger picture of consummation of the age and look at that in the big picture, which is the historical life of Christ. And when that, when that, when he leaves the earth, we call that the first advent and the first advent is in operation until the second advent. I know you know all that, but it just gives me the joy of teaching it. Now, so over here, when he's talking about the importance of this event of redemption, he talks, here's the transgressions. Here's the transgressions of Adam's sin. This is from Adam to Christ. And he talks about the, and over here's transgressions of Adam's sin under the first covenant that was committed under the first covenant. And here is redemption. Under the new covenant. And he calls that the eternal redemption. And this is really important. What we're about to learn here tonight. 
So we got transgression over here. We got redemption over here. Over here, we have a sin debt to be paid. A sin debt. He goes to the cross, and over here, it's paid in full, ain't it? Paid in full. And we, they call that a ransom paid. Right? And, and this is where, this is this whole concept, because when he goes here, one of the key things in the incarnation taking him to the cross is one of the things that comes out of that and of who he is, is he is the mediator. He is the mediator of a new covenant. He is the mediator. He's called the mediator. And um, the book of Hebrews, like um, um, 8, 6, 8th chapter, verse 6, mediator. Boy, it's worth reading. In the ninth chapter, 15, our passage, mediator. Uh, 12th chapter, verse 24, mediator. Boy, I tell you, there are three times that he talks about that that are dynamite. They are dynamite. And, of course, the big one that most people quote outside of Hebrews is of mediator is 1 Timothy, and it's a good one, 1 Timothy 2, 5, and 6. That's, a, that, you know, that's the one that probably most people quote. Uh, but Hebrews, the way the writer, when the writer of Hebrew talks about mediatorship, he's really technical. We're down here, that's general theology. <laughs> that's just soteriology, we call it. But that's a great passage. No, I'm not making light of it. I'm just telling you that there's two, two, you're going to find mediatorship talked about in Hebrews, and you're going to find it by Paul and Timothy uh, in, uh, in the first Timothy. And, uh, but the writer of Hebrews goes in technical. He, he talks about it technically, uh, which makes this kind of important to people like you and me. From Adam to Christ, Adam's original sin and the prophetic gospel, Christ is going to come and die on a cross, be buried and raised from the dead, were presented, but complete just of, uh, judicial pardon was not until Christ dies. That deal is not completed until right there. When Christ says on the cross, it is finished, the redemption is completed, is now has an eternal status. It's completed. It's not completed in the, pic, in the great scheme of things until he does that. You can read about this in Hebrews 7, 11, 25, 10th chapter, verse 14. 10th chapter, you ought to circle that one. Hebrews 10, 14, circle that one. Get a chance to read it, read it. Um, in Hebrews 8, uh, 8, the 8th chapter, 7 and 8, verse 13, 10th chapter, 9 and 10, chapter 9 and 10 is a big one. We're headed that way later. For if the first covenant, and we've talked about this in the past, if the first covenant had been faultless, then there would have been no occasion sought for a second. It, it had, it, well, one of the things was it didn't get anything completed. They had to do it year after year after year after year. But when Christ dies on a cross, he completes it. There is no more year after year after year. There is one forever, one death for all time. And that's a big deal for the new covenant. That's a big deal. That's the difference between the old covenant and new covenant in uh, regard to that. Here's the third point that, uh, uh, and here's the point I really want you to get tonight. We'll, we'll close this down. All the called, all the called, that's believers, all those called into faith in Christ, all the called from Adam to Christ, which were Old Testament believers, receive the promise of eternal inheritance as believers of the new covenant, just as the believers of the new covenant with a completed historical gospel. When he comes down here, all these people back here are, are caught up, are, are completed. That which was waiting for the debt to be completed, they make making installments on it. <laughs> Everybody's making payments on it. He comes, it's paid in full. Once it's that, then everybody gets a paid in full release you understand that the, were they saved of course they were it's just the completion of the bigger in the bigger plan of god we live under a completed program you and i when we tell somebody they get saved and enter into the eternal 
covenant of redemption, that's a big deal. Nobody had that privilege to do that. Christ has to come and die and, and, and declare to, to the Father, it is finished. And when it was finished, that whole deal, everybody is brought in. Everybody's, you know, it's like having a mortgage paid off or whatever. I don't want to get too nuts with this thing. But I'm just trying to tell you, how, how, trying to make some kind of example with you. Uh, listen, Galatians, the third chapter, verse 19 says, until the seed would come to whom the promise, this is everything, the promise in the singular, to whom the promise had been made. These people over here, this is all about promise. I mean, I'm talking about the promise of eternal redemption. That They're holding to a promise. It's fulfilled here, and the promise is fulfilled for them. They're holding to a promise. You should understand that. You're not holding to a promise to go to heaven when you die because the Bible says have from the body present with the Lord? Of course. They, they just hold it on to this promise till this comes. When that comes, then mortgage paid. The, the paid in full. That's, that's all I'm saying. The word promise, until the seed would come, until the seed would come. Who is the seed? G uh, Galatians, the third chapter, verse 16, Christ. I mean, he tells you that in verse 16. Listen, how was Abraham saved? He was saved by this promise. The promise that Christ would come, die on the cross, he got saved by that. But listen, until Christ does it, he doesn't get the eternal benefit of that redemption. Once Christ dies on the cross, he gets the, all the benefits of eternal redemption. All the benefits that you and I get just as a package. <laughs> I mean, we get it as a package. I mean, just a little, you know, a little package. And, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's it. Uh, Galatians 4, 4 says, when the fullness of time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. I talked about that earlier. In Hebrews 11, this is interesting. In Hebrews 11, see, I pay attention to all this kind of stuff because I'm, I'm, I'm nutty. But five times in, the, in Hebrews 11, the word promise is used. Now, see, you don't have to pay attention to the word faith because it dominates it. So once you have, you know that faith is the marker, then you go to a second line of markers because faith dominates passage, agreed? It's a, of course it does, Hebrews 11. So once you establish that that's what that's about, then you go back to see if there are other markers in there. And there is. There's the marker called the promise. Two of the five, it's used five times. Two of the five times, it's in the singular and the rest is plural. In verse nine, in verse nine it's pretty obvious what he's talking about when he uses the word promise and it's singular. And he's talking about, he uses it with the promised land, the promised land. That makes that kind of simple to understand, right? It, that's that's kind of it, that's verse nine, but I'm headed to verse thirty nine in a moment. I'm headed to verse thirty nine. Look how verse thirty eight through four. I wrote it on your paper. This is out of Hebrews eleven, and this is a, there's a little phrase in here that people miss because they don't understand the bigger picture. I'm trying to put the bigger picture on the board for you to understand. So when I can get here, now I'm looking for verse thirty. There's two times the word is used singular. Other than we all believe promise. You know, there are promises in the Bible. But these, these two times it's in the singular, this, this becomes bigger than life to look at. So in verse 38 and 39, here's what it says. It begins by saying, talking about all these men of faith, these super gracers that paid the heaven penalty for walking with Christ until the last breath of, the, of their life, right? And so they go through that and he said, and then there's a phrase that summarizes all the people mentioned in, ver in chapter 11. It says, men of whom the world was not worthy. You have to know that when you're criticized and you're maligned 
and and said you're just an old Bible toting screwy person, right? I mean, yeah, you know, I wear it proudly. That's my badge. I wear it. I wear. It. You know, I'm gonna flaunt it on you, but I'll wear it proud. Um, and so he says, and I love that because it, sometimes I need to read that verse to encourage me. And sometimes the heat just gets on you and you go like, oh, wow. Men of whom the world was not worthy. Now, that's God saying that. And then listen to this. All these talking about now he, what he's done is just looked a panoramic view of all the major believers. Just he picked out a few to highlight them of super gracers, pivot people to span from Christ to span the old covenant right? To span the old covenant and bring you up to the incarnation of Christ. This is what he says. Now, here's how he, here's how he summarized all that. This is so important. Remember who he's talking about. Come on now. Come on now. All of these, everybody, everybody. Okay. All of these having gained approval. That's what the English says. Listen, you know what the word in the Greek is, is the word for martyr. It's martyror. That's an important word. That's a word we use for martyr, or it means if if it's if if you read a passage that's there and it's now if you read that there's a lot of martyrs there, but what it talks about is talking about bearing witness for Christ under maximum stress and pressure. That word means to be remain a true witness for Christ under all maximum pressure. That's why that's why that word is there. It's an aorist passive participle. It means to bear witness under maximum, to bear witness for Christ under extreme pressure. Okay. All of these having gained approval, that's the whole list in Hebrews of everybody, all the way from 38, you know, I mean, 37 back, which are old covenant believers, through their faith, gained approval. That's interesting how God, listen, <laughs> you say, well, how did the writer get to the word approval? When it actually means a witness, a, 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 a witness for Christ that never wavers, no matter what the pressure is. Yeah, kind of like Job, right? Under one example, or it could be pressures of persecutions and other things, but doesn't waver. I mean, by waver, I mean doesn't surrender. And the word ought to be witness. If you're going to change it, if you're going to change this word, so you go like, how, how did they jump? From a witness, a, a believer that remains a witness for Christ, no matter how much pressure is going. Like, I'll give you an example of the guy who did that was Stephen. Right? And, and, and under all that presence, his father forgive them. They, you know, that deal, so he quotes the words for Christ right from the cross, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. Right? Yeah, in, in Acts 7 chapter. This is that. And yet, it's identified as approved. Look, look, look at how it's written in the English language. And, and you go like, why did they do it? Listen, all these having gained approval. Listen to me why he does that. Because everybody in chapter 11 through thir- from 1 to 37, because of their, they're there because of their faithful witness under maximum pressure is how they made the hall, the hall of, of fame, faith hall of fame. And... They have gotten God's approval. That's why they're in the book in places of honor. That's why. But you have to read the whole book to know that's what they mean. I I mean the whole chapter. I don't mean the whole book. All these have gained approval through their faith. See, that's the subject of the, that's the main subject of the, uh, listen, did not receive the promise, singular. Now, the word received is interesting. I wrote it down. Komizo, K-O-M-I-Z-O. Aorist, middle indicative. And the middle of that is important because it means to bear oneself. To bear oneself. Did not receive. Though they carried the load for Christ... Though they honored God, though they paid heavy penalties for it, right? And were approved by God. He put them 
in a book that will be forever. It goes beyond time. Put them in there. Did not receive the promise. Singular. Did not receive the promise because. Now pay attention to this. I didn't write this. Because God had provided something better for us. Who's us? Church age believer. Who's a church age believer? He's right over here under the new covenant. Who comes out of the mediatorship of Jesus Christ, who goes to the cross, goes buried, is raised from the dead the third day. They didn't receive the promise. Listen, in their time on earth, the, during their time on earth, right? They didn't get that. They did not receive the promise. Because God had provided something better for us, listen to me, so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. In other words, this is held in escrow for them so that when Christ comes and dies on the cross and is raised from the dead, they're now brought into the program of eternal redemption. Now, they're dead. They're not... They're not coming back until a while. And it's because of us, of the new covenant, that gives them approved honor. You might say they're living vicariously through us. Isn't that interesting? did not receive the promise because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us, they would not have been made perfect. But because we believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, they there and we are in eternal redemption. They are not honored by it. That's just way out there. Christ came into the world to finish the work of redemption in the plan of God. When he said in John 19.30, it is finished. It gave you a different look at that. All right, guys, I appreciate that. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.